Take your Bibles out, please, and open them up to the Gospel according to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And while you're turning there, a great big round of applause to Steve Lambert for filling the pulpit for me last Sunday. Steve, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. So John chapter 11. So we're thinking a little bit about the future this morning and heaven and all those kinds of things. Now here's reality. Unless the Lord comes back fairly soon in our lifetime, that means that on some future day, each and every one of us individually will die. And Lord willing, some people will like us enough to actually come to our funerals to remember us. And here's the thing, I, I, I hope they remember us for our better successes and not our worst failures. You ever showed up at a funeral, let me tell you what that guy was really like, you know, we don't really do that, but I hope that's the case. Shakespeare, interestingly, he phrased this perfectly when he had Antony say at the funeral of his friend Julius Caesar, I quote, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. And that's the truth. The truth. And and the same thing is true of a very minor figure in this gospel, and his name is Thomas. Now, when we hear Thomas's name, I think most of us immediately think of what? Doubting Thomas, right? I mean, we automatically think of the story where Thomas expressed disbelief in Christ's resurrection. I mean, poor Thomas. You think about it, we forget that all the other disciples, well, they didn't believe that Jesus was raised either until they saw him. What a different picture we might have of Thomas, though. If we could just remember the incident that occurs right here in the 11th chapter. In fact, I purposely stopped at verse 16 two Sundays ago so that I could literally shine the spotlight this morning on this single verse. And I'll just tell you right now, this is a wake-up sermon. Some Bible passages are encouraging. Not really this one. Some Bible passages convict us or teach us and some wake us up. They just slap us upside the head. And they force us to ask, am I just playing at Christianity? Am I playing fast and loose with God, doing just enough to maybe keep him on my good side? Or, or am I using Jesus just for what I can get, what I want? Or would I really give up anything and follow him anywhere? And even identify with him so completely that I would die for him? if it really came down to that. And so the text before us today is just such a wake-up call. But let me reset the stage. Jesus received word from the sisters, Mary and Martha, that their brother Lazarus was ill, I mean literally dying. And shocking the disciples, he, he announced his intention not to go to Bethany where, where Lazarus was, but to go back to Jerusalem. I mean, Jerusalem, that scared the disciples to death because Christ enemies there had tried to stone him to death on a number of occasions by this point in the gospel. And now Jesus is going back there? And so the 12 apostles are understandably frightened. I mean, they knew they couldn't stop Jesus, but it's like, what are we going to do? I mean, really, what are we going to do? I imagine all 12 men just kind of silently looked at each other, literally contemplating refusing to follow Jesus because to go to Jerusalem was to go to die. And I'll tell you, nobody purposely walks straight to their death. But then there's this one lonely voice that just spoke up. And it was the grim voice of Thomas. And he said to his fellow disciples in verse 16, Let us go also, that we may die with him. And my goodness, how can you not admire Thomas's words? These are honest words because going to Jerusalem was a death sentence. These were loyal words. No matter what lay ahead, Thomas was determined to be right there with Jesus. And, and these were courageous words. Thomas was willing to go with Jesus right into the, the lion's den. Now I know that eventually Thomas and all the other guys, they fled from Christ. I know also that Jesus' death in Jerusalem, because he did get killed there. We know that wasn't the whole story. There was a resurrection, praise God, that followed that. But I'll tell you, Thomas said these words before all that happened. At that moment in time, regardless of what the future held, Thomas did the right thing. He followed Jesus 
even if it meant death. And so the spotlight on this verse this morning is a question. Will you, like Thomas, follow Jesus Christ through anything, anywhere? Will you die to yourself and your desires in order to live to Jesus Christ? Now before you answer, I know the church you answer, but let me just tell you, we American Christians are not too prone to answer yes to that kind of question. And I'll tell you why. It's because our Christianity here in America is kind of unique and it has been shaped by American democracy. In fact, we probably know about American democracy more than we know about Christianity. It's interesting, it took a European, an Englishman, a guy named John Guest. He put his finger on this very American way of warping Christianity. Guest is an English evangelist. He came to the United States to pastor a church. And when he arrived in Philadelphia, which is where he was going to become a pastor, he took a tour of the city. He saw all these battle cries, all these slogans from back in the Revolutionary War era. And we've heard them, you know, no taxation without representation, right? You know, don't tread on me, things like that. But the sign really that drew his attention the most was the one that announced with big bold letters, we serve no sovereign here. And I'll tell you, that's very American. My goodness, and I love it. Our forefathers revolted against England's King George. And then the great part was next, when General Washington kicked their blimey rear ends. And every American ought to go, hey man, I mean, if you're English, you know, you got to love that. And we have never bowed the knee to a king ever since. We serve no sovereign here. And I'll tell you, that is a great slogan for American democracy. Wow, but not so much for the kingdom of God. Because a sovereign monarch named King Jesus rules and reigns. In fact, when John Guest read that battle cry, he later wrote a letter to his friend R.C. Sproul. Some of you have heard of him. And he described his feelings, I quote from the letter. That sign stopped me in my tracks. I had left my native land and come across the Atlantic Ocean in response to a call, a vocation to be a minister of the gospel to proclaim the kingdom of God. But on seeing this sign, I was filled with fear and consternation. I, I thought, how can I possibly preach the kingdom of God to people who have a profound aversion to sovereignty? We don't like kings. And so we American church people have a massive problem because the gospel literally commands us to die to ourselves and to pledge our lives to King Jesus. Our version of Christianity, I don't need to tell it's all about us. In, in, in American Christianity, usually we're the kings, we're the queens. Oh, and Jesus helps us get what we want, right? He helps us have our best life right now. Is Jesus meeting my needs? Am I becoming the best version of myself? Is Jesus helping me overcome my demons and doubts and my all, just all the things that I'm struggling with? No thoughts of the eternal kingdom. Am I going there? Am I prepared for judgment day? Am I living right now in light of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Well, I tell you, Thomas's comment rises up this morning and literally slaps us in our collective faces. And it really drives home just this one overarching major principle. The Christian life demands death and denial. Dying and saying no to yourself and the world in order to say yes to Jesus Christ. Now we find that, we find that principle all through the New Testament. We, we read in Romans 6, If we have been united with Christ in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Or again, we could read in Galatians 2.20 very simply where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Or later on in chapter 6, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And so just let me repeat, death and denial for a Christian, that is one of the most critical principles imaginable in the Christian life. But let me hurry up and add, we don't want to naturally give in to any of that. I don't want to embrace that. I mean, who wants to die? Nobody. Who here 
wants to deny themselves? Who, wants to, who here wants to turn down a chance to fulfill their desires? And let me just be honest, and let's all be honest, nobody. We don't want to do that. And then add to that, add to that the fact we live in a culture nowadays that, that says no to nothing. No is unpopular today. But, but this is where Christianity begins and ends. We, we must actually die to ourselves and live to Christ. And so the question is, if you're going, well, how do you do that, preacher? How practically in your day-to-day -day life can you die to yourself and live to Christ? What does it take to be a disciple like Thomas who follows Jesus anywhere? I'll just say it like this. You must just say no. I know I'm stealing an old slogan, but just say no. Say no to anything contrary to the Bible. And you're scratching your head and go, well, wow, Pastor, I mean, there's only hundreds of things that the Bible says to say no to. I mean, how in the world do I navigate all of that practically? Well, thankfully, John, who wrote this gospel, also gave us this wonderful breakdown in what we call his first epistle. It's called 1 John. Here's what John writes there. He says, speaking to Christian people, people who say, oh, I love Jesus, I'm going to follow him. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world... Well, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the, from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Beautiful passage. Tremendous death and denial passage. But what's helpful, and here's why I read that to you. John listed three categories into which every temptation that you will ever face in your life, every temptation to self, what you want to do, what you want to be, your natural desire to be a queen or a king of your life and just get Jesus to help you get what you want, all, everything there can be grouped into one of these three categories right there, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. So for instance, just beneath, for instance, the, the pride of life category, you have got to say no to the love of God. Money, money. The Bible says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And then get this, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. Let me remind you that money is not neutral for Christians because it has the capacity to lead you away from faith in Jesus Christ. The destructive power of money loving is precisely why Jesus warned where your treasure is, oh, there, there your heart will be also. And I can see it. The rich young ruler, he comes in from stage right as exhibit A. Do you remember when Jesus told that rich young man to sell his possessions if he had any hope of earning eternal life? Now think about that. This man knew exactly the truth. He loved Jesus, wanted to go to heaven, and oh my goodness, his love of money kept him out of the eternal kingdom of heaven. Now let's just look at it honestly. Money loving diverts our attention from following Jesus. Money loving keeps our hearts rooted to the wrong kingdom, the one of this world. And in the end, I'll tell you this, money loving people die and they go to hell. Oh, curiously, well, how much do they get to bring? How much do they bring with them? How much of their money? Oh, wow, none of it. Here's a photograph of a lady named Heidi Horton. Heidi was an Austrian heiress. She was the wife of a German billionaire named Helmut Horton. Helmut was a Nazi. Became filthy wealthy with, with Nazi blood money. And he lavished his wife with jewels and jewelry. Well, Heidi died last year. Her entire collection, in fact, it's the auction that's being conducted by Christie's, it ends today, I think. It's today or tomorrow. It's going on right now. They're auctioning off her entire collection. Now, let me quote from the auction ad. Blazing sapphires and lush emeralds drip from the necklaces, brooches, and bracelets. One standout piece called the Briolette of India includes a 90 carat diamond 90 carats we could do a little little contest here ladies raise your ring hand you know right to your jewelry as the Beatles said you know I wonder what the biggest ring here is I don't know you know but 90 carats 
And it includes, they say, an estimate of 7.8 million. Those jewels are among the 700 jewels from Heidi's estate. It is the largest jewelry sales in world history. Uh, experts estimate the total take will be in excess of $150 million. But, I don't want you to let this sink in, Heidi Horton did not get to take even one jewel into the afterlife with her. Not one ring, not one brooch, not one emerald, certainly not that big 90 carat diamond, and neither can you, whatever your jewels are. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? So if you are going to die to yourself and deny yourself in order to say yes to Jesus Christ, you have got to say no to the love of money. Say no also, still under the pride of life category, to, to pride and position. This too is part of death and denial. Do you know when, when the crucifixion drew near, Jesus pulled the 12 apostles aside and he warned them in advance about the atrocities that he was getting ready to go through. Just the arrest, the brutality, the beating, just, you know, just publicly and then just crucified. And well, it makes you wonder, well, how do they respond to that? How do these men who loved Jesus and followed him, given up on everything they had to, to, to do in life and followed him for three years, loved him, their master, and they hear this terrible news, how, how do they respond? Oh, wow. They argued among themselves over which of them was the greatest. No, I am. Oh, no, no, he loves me more. Oh, no, I, I'm going to be the, you know, that's what they did. Pride and position. I tell you, they are powerful lures for sinners like you and me. And so Luke, in his gospel, records Jesus' reaction to their selfish, callous attitude. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, he knew what they were doing. He took a child. And you need to know in that culture, children were just, just almost throwaway. They didn't value children the way we do today at all. I mean, literally, if a couple had a, a baby daughter in particular, oh, often they just cast her off the side of the road. You can't believe the butchery and the savagery of the Roman Empire. And so Jesus takes the most inconsequential thing in the world, which in those days was a child, and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name, receives me and whoever receives me receives him who sent me for he who is least among you all is the one who is great wow we just need to let that sink in now listen Jesus was not denying position and influence and power to his followers no he was establishing a crucial spiritual principle that it's just this if you are a Christian whether you are great or small, you will humble yourself before others. You just can't get around it. I don't care who you are. God might ele you, elevate you to second in command at your company. You might have all the jewels someday. What well, used to be Heidi's, maybe you'll get to buy them someday. And if you buy the 90 carat diamond, come and show it off. We'll show it. Look at that. They got it. But guess what? They're going to die. Somebody else is going to get it. It's not going away. It's not going off into the afterlife. God might elevate you to second in command. He elevated Joseph to second in command of, of Egypt. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you will never lift your head arrogantly to anyone, even the lowest person you meet. You will say no to pride and position. We'll say no also to, and this one fits into the, really two categories, the desires of the flesh and the eyes, but say no to sexual immorality. Why would I bring that up in church? Well, because history and the Bible are full of sexual perversion. Because our culture is the most sexualized culture in modern history. Because modern technology puts sexual perversion in our faces all the time. Because the overwhelming majority of teenagers admit to viewing pornography. Because adultery wrecks marriages every day. Because the sexual choice and gender identity of LGBTQ directly attack God's sexual ethic for Christians. I think you get the point. It is impossible to address death and denial without addressing sexuality. And the Bible is far from silent on the issue. 1 Corinthians 6.18 just simply says, flee immorality. Ephesians 5.3, 
Immorality must not even be named among you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God that you abstain from sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. If you and I are Christians, we will deny ourselves and live for Christ by saying no to sexual immorality. What else? What else does death and denial require? Well, you must say no. This one under the category of the desires of the flesh. Say no, give me some leeway, to your big fat mouth. Now some of you really have a big fat mouth. <laughs> well, so do you preacher. You're a big fat. Well why? I'll tell you why. Because your mouth, my mouth, they reveal who we really are. In the Bible your mouth is attached to your heart. It just is. What, what is in your heart, heart just comes right out your mouth. That's just the way it works. It's, it's attached right out your mouth. Do you have a potty mouth? Oh your heart is full of potty. <laughs> That's the romper room version. Do you complain a lot? You have a discontented heart. Do you lie? You have a deceitful heart. Do you brag and show off? Your heart is riddled with self-doubt. Did you tell dirty jokes? Your heart is filthy. Do you slander and criticize people? Your heart is sick with inferiority. You get the point. Our mouths are directly attached to our hearts, and our hearts reveal who we really are. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Mark 7, 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts. Fornications, thefts, murders, adultery. Matthew 15, 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication. You get the point. Uh, all of these godless acts flow straight from the heart. Oh, and the mouth signals the coming. It's just like, here it comes. Here's who I am. Getting ready to show up on stage. Because our mouths are attached to our hearts. So if you cuss, complain, and badger, you've got a heart problem. If you backstab, lie, and spread rumors, you have a heart problem. If you swagger, brag, and show up, you have a heart problem. If you talk dirty, flirt, and use innuendo, you have a heart problem. You are polluted. You don't have a mouth problem, you have a heart problem. You don't have a mouth problem, you have a spiritual problem, and you're not born again. Because a born again Christian embraces death and denial by saying no to their big, fat mouth. I could go on and on with this saying no list because the Bible goes on and on. The point is that true Christians embrace death and denial by saying no to themselves and yes to Christ. I was talking to a college boy not long ago about Christianity. And so his family attended church back when he was a little boy. And then he just kind of fell out of going to church like a lot of families do just for the rest of his childhood. But when he moved away to college for his freshman year, he made, made some friends with a couple of guys who were committed Christians and, and following Jesus Christ, just like Thomas. And, and they took this kid to church with him. He started going to church, started going to a campus ministry there on, on the college campus. And, and, and as I talked with this guy, he made a very honest comment about Christianity. And he said, I get the belief part. I get the belief part. In other words... He believes. He believes the, the, the Bible's gospel message that God is redeeming sinners to himself and bringing them into his eternal kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. He said, I believe in Jesus. I believe he was real. All that stuff. I believe he's God. And then he goes, my problem, he just admit, he goes, my problem is actually following Christ as Lord. Isn't that something? He put his finger right on authentic Christianity. See the problem, the problem is not the believing part, the problem is the following part. He is a college boy who knows intellectually who Jesus is. He knows in his mind what Jesus commands of him. He's also a college kid who's honest enough to just say, I I'm really not sure I'm willing to, to give up on me to follow him. He's just honest enough to say it. So let me ask, 
all this death and denial stuff. Is it hard? Oh my, is it hard? I mean, am I an idiot? Yes, it's hard. It's hard. We get tired of saying no to ourselves all the time. We know, we know all the answers. We know Jesus is the better choice. Jesus is the better way. But my goodness, we still find it hard to say no to ourselves and yes to Jesus. Let me give just a little perspective maybe. Maybe this will be helpful. Uh, you heard of a Toyota 4Runner? Toyota 4Runner. You're like, where's he going with this one? Well, follow me in the 4Runner. Toyota 4Runner is one of the coolest four-wheel drive vehicles on the market. And I'm a little biased because I have one. You know, 4Runner. Toyota chose the forerunner name several years ago because it picks up on the image of a rugged frontiersman. And I like that. You know, he slogs through the swamps, he blazes the trails, he is leading the way for others to follow. Now, here's the thing following the forerunner, whoever he is, that's still hard work. I mean, if you follow a forerunner, I mean, you're still driving over and around rocks and roots and ravines. You got to do all that. But. The way is easier because you are following the forerunner who went ahead of you and blazed the trail, right? Now, at the risk of sounding silly and yet standing on solid theological ground, Jesus is our forerunner. He's our forerunner. And here's what I mean. He's always one step ahead of you. He's always one step ahead. He blazed the trail for us. We follow him. What he went through, that's what we go through. What he faced, that's what we face. What he suffered, I mean, what he suffered, rather, we suffer. Why? Because, use a Bible language, we were baptized into him when we were born again. In other words, we were united with him. Oh, he died. Oh, we're going to die too. And I mean figuratively and literally someday. What he went through, because he's a forerunner, we're coming right in behind him. If he went through it, you're going to go through it. We're united to him. And, and this is why following Jesus. And hear this. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to, it's never going to not be hard. Expect death and denial to be hard. And why is that? Because the hard rocks and roots and ravines of your life that you face every day, those are the very things that Jesus endured while he was here. His entire three-year ministry is often just one frustrating thing after another. The cup he drank was the cup of suffering, the New Testament says. And since he is our forerunner, guess what? Oh, we just follow in his steps. That's what we do. Well, following Jesus then, it, it will be loaded of hard choices, confusing paths, don't know where to go, frustrating people, endless trials. Just let the reality of that sink in. But then I want you to hear quickly the good news about the forerunner. The good news. Because... You were united to Jesus Christ in his death. Oh, you will also be raised to new life. Just like he was. Just like he was. In fact, here's what the Bible says in Romans 6. If we have been united with Christ in a death like his, which we have. He's our forerunner there. Oh, but look at this. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Where's Jesus right now, by the way? Where is he? Oh, it's an easy one. Oh, he's in heaven. At the right hand of the Father. I want you to understand that reunion that happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus went back. It wasn't just deity meeting up with deity. The two members of the Trinity going, hey, how you doing? You'll fist bump. Good job, boy. You know what? No. I mean, there's only one human body. There's only one body of flesh in heaven right now. Whose is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. Your forerunner. Your flesh is in heaven. Your flesh is sitting right there at the right throne of God, at the right hand of God. That, that's, that's what we have to look forward to. So think about it. When he ascended to heaven, he took our human flesh with him. The fact that our older brother is sitting at the right hand of God right now guarantees that we will be there the moment we, that we die. Our, our forerunner already blazed the trail, and, and you will follow. So, yes, the path here is hard sometimes. But the path leads all the way to glory, where Jesus is waiting. And, and you will be there someday. And, and when you do get there, by the way, all, all these rocks and roots and ravines, oh, they're just a thing of the past. There's going to be no more tears, trials, or tribulation, just eternal rest and joy with Jesus. And so let me just stop right there. You see, there's the spotlight. Will you be like Thomas and just follow Jesus anywhere? and everywhere. 
And will you just commit or, or perhaps recommit yourself to death and denial, saying no to your own self, no to your own desires, and just following the Lord Jesus Christ through whatever. Would you please stand to your feet as you consider answering that? Would you please close your eyes and bow your heads? And Heavenly Father, we just thank you for just this, this one simple little comment from Thomas. Just the beauty of it. Just how we would admire his words. And we know, Lord, that he failed even after saying that, but that's what we do too. Praise God for this wonderful forerunner named Jesus Christ who blazed the trail for us. He's ahead of us. He's always clearing the way. He's always a step ahead of us out there, Lord. And we just want to thank you that he went to the cross for us. And we thank you that he is the guarantee that all of the hardness and difficulty now is worth it because we will be with you someday because he's there with you. And we are in him. We are united in him. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.